the the um the stock answer i don't think i have time. stock answers unless i'm walking and people are just like hey how you doing and then you know you say oh good how are you blah, blah, blah. i tell them everything <laughs> you stop a person in the middle of their exercise and tell them everything well, about since you asked <laughs> actually my credit cards are due today i don't want to pay them <laughs> Listen, I feel like they should have rewards programs because if you have been paying on time all year, mm -hmm. just let me take a month off. Well, they give you like some credit cards give you like cash incentive, cash back incentives or something. First of all, pennies on the dollar. Okay. Take, reduce the interest rate. If I'm paying on time all year, take the interest rate down. Right. Down to like one, one or two percent. I'll do that. One or two percent. Oh, okay. I mean, I just want to one percent would show my appreciation. And like two percent the bill, responsibility. Me paying the bill is on time for the entire time that I've had the credit card is appreciation enough. Get me down to zero again. <laughs> just give me a month of zero, and I will use that credit card. A uh, true, very true, very true. The year is slowly coming to an end. And this has been one, I don't even know how to describe this time period between January and December in the year of 2020. Tumultuous comes to mind. Um, enlightening. Unsettling. Enlightening. Uh, Mind-blowing is probably... Uh, is is probably a word that I would use. What is one thing that you felt you have lost this year and one thing that you felt that you've gained? I've lost um, some autonomy actually and just being able to do what I want when I want to do it. Mm. Um, and that has been extremely challenging for me to navigate and for me to accept because I've, I'm someone who is very, I don't like to be bogged down. I don't feel like, like to feel like I'm, I'm stuck somewhere. And right. so being stuck in the house has been um, a learning experience for me. But I've also gained more um, insight into what makes me tick. Mm. So, yeah, I've gained a lot of just strategies, even through working with my life coach and stuff and just like reading different books and stuff and working with students. I've learned a lot of different strategies on um, for me to just step back and take more um, take inventory of whatever I'm feeling in that moment mm -hmm. and separate it from what other people are um, feeling and projecting onto me. So, okay, insight into me. <laughs> I think Don't this lie. has definitely been no. I'm I agree with you. This has <sighs> definitely been a year for personal growth. Uh, it's it's been. You know, we're in the house and we can't distract ourselves with driving to work. Some of us um, mm -hmm. with driving to work or being involved and in going out to brunch every three days or, you know, hanging out with the fellas or hanging out with the ladies or being distracted by all these things. We have to really sit in and deal with ourselves. And this year was a great reminder that if it does not bring you joy, if it's not at least worth it in the end, then do something else. Just do what's going to make you happy. Yeah. Like why waste time just trying to make something work if try it maybe twice or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this isn't clicking. Let me just move on. Yes. Yeah. Just move away from this. Like you can do whatever you're doing in that spot. And I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to be me and we will be well apart from right. each other. Like, I mean, life is so fleeting and we assume that we have, you know, an eternity to do, to accomplish the things or do whatever, which is the procrastination side. But then there's also like a planner side of me that's like, I have to hit these milestones by these arbitrary dates mm -hmm. in hopes that, you know, I would achieve some standard of success that is set by society. And it's like, 
now more than ever, I've seen on social media that <laughs> it's gonna be whatever, whatever you make it. There's yeah. no no time, there's no age. You do what you love. Yeah. And I know before we started this, we were talking about um this is just behind the scenes thing. We were in the green room, you know. Um, <laughs> we were talking about like Twitter and Instagram and stuff and how we sort of lean more towards Twitter. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason why I'm leaning, I've always leaned a little bit more towards Twitter because it's been more, um, honestly, for the way that I've curated my timeline and stuff, it's been more authentic and that mm -hmm. people aren't necessarily just showing like the best moments and stuff and making it feel like we have to keep up or try to keep up with each other. Right. It's been easier to just kind of pop in and check in on these virtual friends that I've had for over 10 years now. Um, and so I don't, I've noticed that when I, check more so on Twitter as opposed to checking other social media sites and stuff, I'm not comparing myself to what other people are doing. And I'm not um, setting those milestones and being too hard on myself. That, oh my gosh, I had that realization last week. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, Instagram is, because it's visual. Yeah, it's all marketing. Know, you know, you all you get to, you see the finished product of everything, even when stuff is not finished. You know, yeah, everything and, has that polish to it, where it's like has that sheen, where it just seems like it's if you poke at it, if you touch it, then the facade will fall apart. Right. Or if you um, like if you scrub at it a little bit, it'll just be tarnished or whatever underneath. Um, and I'm realizing like I don't really want that so much mm. anymore in my life. Like I don't, well, not so much in my life. Like I like Instagram for what it once was, where it was more so um, just sharing photography mm. and that visual aspect. But now it's, everything is marketing and everything is to try to get you to buy something. And right. it right. comes across in the post and everything. And everybody's trying to trick the algorithm and stuff. And it's just, come on. This just, is yeah, yeah, there's a there's a level of gaming that just does not work when it yeah. comes to Instagram, even getting out, um, even starting, you know, as a business or um, whatever the case may be. It's mm -hmm. it's always people trying to game. Let me yeah. get so many followers that I'll go back and unfollow everybody mm -hmm. um, so that I can get my posts on top or whatever the case may be. And Twitter has actively put. um blocks in place to prevent the follow unfollow yeah. um, situation from occurring as often. Mm -hmm. But I do like the genuineness when people are like, you know what, I'm having a crappy day. Or um, there's a lot of oversharing on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> so much oversharing, but you get to see that people aren't just putting out um, just snapshots of perfection. Yeah, it's like, you get to see a see more a complete process. picture. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what I like. I I, I appreciate that. Uh, but thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Take a Space Podcast. I am your host, Leah, and I am here with Jason. Thank you so much for being with me today. She took note of last time. She didn't say <laughs> Professor Jason. <laughs> no, we're going to take that. We're not going to have that persona. We want to make sure that you have your own identity. For those who didn't um, tune in to our last talk, we did talk about the importance of not being identified by what you do in this culture that we have that is defined by what you do. But... Um, but yeah, I appreciate you talking with me today. Um, and in, in the same vein of talking about what is offered as far as Twitter and Instagram, there's always going to be a new platform. But I think most importantly, when you're on these different platforms, just like you have found for the last 10 years, is finding your community. Right. And when you find your community, it helps you to build not only your self-awareness, but helps you to engage more with those who are like-minded so that you feel at least a little bit less alone. Yeah. So we had something else to talk about today, but this led in perfectly to what I wanted to talk about previously, uh, which is collaboration versus competition. Mm. And... 
being a newer entrepreneur, I've been an entrepreneur status pretty much like been dabbling in it my whole life. But now that it's official, official, you know, got the EIN, got the registration, paid all those bills, <laughs> got the website, doing the business, you know, championsofdiscourse.com. Or drop you know. those acronyms. <laughs> the initials. But um, with all those things, what I'm finding is that a lot of people are wanting to, like you said, game the system, you know, try to game the algorithm to try to not even game it, but cheat the algorithm mm -hmm. to get more followers, get go viral, get likes, do these crazy stunts and things, um, but not really taking time to build the community. Mm -hmm. What has helped you to build the community that you have on social media? Alicia Keys. So I'll be 100% <laughs> upfront with that. Um, so I joined Twitter in August 2007. And so before that, um, the biggest, Alicia Keys fan base has always been the one that has been the most, um, I've been the most engaged with. Mm -hmm. So before Twitter, before everybody joined Twitter and stuff, we had this message board, which was like Alicia Keys online message board. And it wasn't um, the official form or anything, but it was just like a site that one of her fans made. And a lot of us didn't want to pay for the um, official membership. So we joined uh, that site instead. Okay. But we were a lot closer than the people who were in the official system. So by the time Twitter rolled around, we had all followed each other and everything. And so this is dating back to like 2002. 2003. So like, I've known these people for basically my entire adult life. Um, so what you, what was that MySpace? No, it was actually before MySpace too. It was literally just that message board. So what was, what was happening to them too? So before MySpace, so I know like AOL. AOL. Yeah, yeah, AOL Messenger. Messenger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yahoo but Messenger. That was at the point where it's like, okay, I met these people online on this message board they're not getting my Yahoo Messenger. So I, like everything that we did on there, it was just like, okay, on the message board, this is where we talk and stuff. And until I log back in, I don't know you. Don't try to get my phone number. Don't try to get my um, my email or anything. It was very early 2000s. The internet is a dangerous place. Right, 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 right. Um, and I was what, like 15, 14, 15 at that point. So um, by the time Twitter rolled around and we everybody joined and stuff, we still had like our same community and everything and so but we were still branching out and talking like to other fan bases and stuff but it was still very um close-knit where a lot of people didn't want to branch out and follow too many people that they didn't know because mm -hmm. they didn't want too much of their own personal information out there and i think this might have even been before twitter had like a private mode where you could lock your account and protect your tweets uh yeah i almost forget that it has that feature I almost forget sometimes. I do and I don't because sometimes I'll have this have quick moments of paranoia where <laughs> where I'm like, crap, my students probably saw my username on um like when I was sharing my screen or something. Better lock it just for a quick second, real quick, just for a few days. <laughs> or if I want to say <laughs> something particularly um opinionated, particularly and particularly opinionated then I'll lock my account for a few days just to say what I need to say and have my conversation with my people and then open it back up once it gets buried down a little bit. But anybody yeah. listening to this, don't go digging. There's no like N words or F words thrown out there. I don't even really curse on my Twitter or anything. So you're not going to find the inflammatory things that you're looking for mm -hmm. in my career. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, my Twitter, I got, got most of my followers once Alicia Keys followed me on Twitter. Um, so by that point, she followed me in like 2010 or something like that. And so when she followed me, more and more people just started following. And um, it got kind of scary at first for me. But it never got to the point where it was like I was trying to um, either get more attention than I than initially did. Because, of course... I was a fan, I'm a huge fan of her. So of course I'll post and stuff to try to share information and stuff with her, but I wasn't going out of my way like, oh, look at this picture. Oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. I was still being very much just Jason and just like, if I didn't agree with something that she was doing or agree with something that was happening in general, even amongst my followers, I 
either let it be known or I just kept my, um, just bit my tongue. So I think for me, it was just always, no matter how many followers I got or how many followers I, um, cause I've been stagnant where I am and I'm good with that. But no matter where I was at with my followers, I was always sharing information the exact same way. And I was always sharing information about myself in the exact same way. So, <laughs> so first of all, I think it's, I think that was, um, when you first told us about you going to the concert and meeting her, that was pretty cool. And then the fact that she the followed time, you like yeah. after it, I was like, oh. Look, like what? Okay, the first time I went to the concert, um, yeah. that was the Element of Freedom tour, I think 2010. And I met her backstage and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, holy crap, this is weird. And then she followed me, I think a few months after that on Twitter. And so there'll be like, little bits of just like um, interaction here and there and just like liking tweets and stuff like that. And then one of her people reach out to me, like when she performed in San Francisco for the Super Bowl, one of her people reaches out to me and says, Hey, would you like to come to her, her sound check to meet her? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so it's, it's weird because even though I don't necessarily, I'm not actively engaged in the, um, in interacting with her as much as I was before, like going, Ham trying to defend and stuff and just trying to get attention and just being a stand like that. Yeah. Just because we have been, or me and a few other people that are in the same fan base, um, just because we have been consistently authentic throughout our um, interactions with her people on Twitter and on Instagram and everything, they still recognize that and they still include us and stuff. Um, and just being, nice. yeah, they people pick up on it. I pick up on it too. You pick up on it just when people are trying to put on on social right, media. Right. You can always tell when it's forced and people are trying to go viral and yeah. post like very uh, salacious. Is that the word I want to use? Yeah. So. Uh, just like very salacious posts or very uh, polarizing posts. Um, yeah. Like, I think well, that people it's negate. Not just my opinion. Yeah. Right. People negate um, building community as if they just want follows right and i'm just yeah. like but it's it's more about it's more about engagement as opposed to followers mm -hmm. i think that even though when people get into whatever social media and their goal is to get a million likes a thousand views six hundred thousand whatever right trying to get the follows, trying to get the numbers up, trying to get the engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget. I think Kevin, Kevin on stage told this story about how this girl who had over 1 million followers and all she had to do was sell 20 shirts to keep her sponsorship or some, something low. It was some low number that she had. And even with all these followers, because of the types of pictures she was posting or whatever, nobody, nobody bought into it. Mm -hmm. But some guy with 11,000 followers had been running a Patreon who they co they constantly supported him. Yeah. He's been able to quit his job and work full time supporting that community. See? And so it's, I mean, being supported by that community. And so it's just like, you don't want to get out here and compete with people who you think is your competition. Well, you can collaborate and go further. And right. I'll take it take it away from social media for a second and start talking about the field. Like with, even with you being a professor and me um, doing, I've been working on curriculum writing. I have been working on it. She's been doing it. I've been working on it. I have a draft that is coming out, hopefully by the first week in December. Coming out to me, been right? doing it. And so, huh? Coming out to me, right? Yes. you. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be printed out. I'm going to make sure I edit it, then type it back up again and then send it to you. So I want to stick um, you want to stick. I want to stick. I mean, you can put an emoji somewhere in there. Just hide an <laughs> Easter egg for me. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that it's, um, some people may, may not want to, especially in this year, in the year, pretty much in the year of entrepreneurs, there's a big push in entrepreneurship this year. And I think that even with this big push in entrepreneurship, people are, people, get so caught up in 
well, everybody's doing like even for podcasts, everybody's doing podcasts or everybody's yeah. going to be a teacher. Or everybody's being everybody's a lawyer or everybody is um, a mechanic or everybody's a contractor. You know, we have these ideas that the market is so flooded that there's no room for me. Mm-hmm. But if you collaborate, you and three other contractors can come together, have a business or come together to do projects for other people. Right. There, that way you can support multiple communities at the same time. Or, you know, as a teacher, I know uh, for you, you've had a lot of people that if you were in competition with them, there's a lot that you would have missed, right? Right. Yeah. Um, Cause remember I do the mentor thing too. So on my campus we have um, with the English departments, they have, or the, sorry, the entry, the transfer level English class has the main transfer level class. And then there's a, um, there's a um, support class that's attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so with the support class, you get two professors. And so I'm the second professor, the mentor for that. And um, I've actually heard horror stories of people who have been in that mentor position where they don't know how to step back and actually just sort of be co-pilot and just um, Mm -hmm. kind of just be an assistant in the class as opposed to trying to take over the class and teach the class how they see fit. So um, yeah, that's been one of the things for me that I've always valued as a professor is just talking to as many other instructors as possible to figure out what they're going through. One, to make sure that whatever I'm um, trying out or whatever is going, whatever is happening in my class to see if it's normal and see if it's mm-hmm. happening to them too, to make sure I'm not alone, yeah. but also to get their feedback to see how they could mm-hmm. um, learn from it or how I could learn from what their experiences were like and try to apply that. Um, one of the things with that that's really important to keep in mind is that no matter how much experience you have in whatever your field is, no matter how much experience you have, the newest person that's coming in that you think is just the rookie that just doesn't know how anything works, they probably know something that you don't know. And right. they probably have a completely different perspective on how to um, advance whatever mission you're after, how to advance that in a way that you wouldn't think of that would either have better results or just results that would help you um, alter your approach so that you can get the effect that you're going after or so that you can be as effective as possible, basically. Yeah, I, I think that we have to be open in order for us to thrive as people of the world, as people who are within communities, we have to be willing to collaborate on even because I think that, and I felt it too, initially, I felt it mm-hmm. where when I started out in this podcast community, I just, I thought to myself, how would I want to be supported? Even if I don't know everything about there is everything there is to know about podcasting, what can I do to feel supported? Okay, let me engage. So I would post regularly tagging different podcasters, shouting out different podcasters, um, giving other podcasters a platform. And then all of a sudden my followers start going up, right? And start, I mean, start going up rapidly, rapidly. That's when I was engaged in Twitter like six, or seven times a day. But hey, I have a life. More than me at one point. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm yeah. like, I've been on Twitter for 13 years. I'm like, okay, you put in some work in this time. Yeah, time. I did. I, like, I did. And um, so, you know, engaging with people, tagging yeah. people, promoting people, uh, joining different groups, and um, really like, with a vibrant spirit going out there. Hey, what can I do? What can I learn? Asking questions. And I think that, huh? Oh, no, I was just gonna ask one question um, about you doing all that stuff. Have, did you notice that there was a lot of um, compromise on your part where it's like, okay, normally I wouldn't do this or normally I wouldn't look at it in this way, but in order to help advance the community, then I'm comfortable with doing it. Did you find that there was a lot of compromise in that way? I didn't, I don't, I don't think I've ever had to compromise anything. The only thing I probably had to compromise was if I went on the show, which I haven't had, I haven't had that issue uh, as of yet. I know it's going to happen, but going on, being a guest on someone else's show who curses a lot. Oh, okay. I haven't had, I haven't run into that issue. That's the only compromise that I would have, that what I would have had. But mm-hmm. even with people who curse a lot, I know they work professional jobs. So I'm right. like, talk to me and you're not cursing voice. <laughs> let's, mm-hmm. do, let's do that. Cause I pretty much keep it clean on this show. But um, 
but I just pretty much engaged just like like I would want it to be engaged with. So right. I would retweet, I would like, I would comment, I would promote. And um, and then even the rotating co-host, the whole reason why rotating co-host became a thing was because I didn't want to have to worry about depending on one person to be available to record every week. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to put all that stress on that one person. So Kate, that while Kate was Kayla's my co-host, huh? That was a big thing for you too. Yes. I remember early on when you were starting and I remember that conversation that we had about that and you mm-hmm. were hesitant to the rotating idea at first, but yeah. then you got around to making it work for how you, um, so it could still fit your vision. Yes. And it, and it has, and I've been able to have multiple co-hosts, multiple guests. And, um, it's been, it's been great. Like right now I have like a pool of seven, which mm-hmm. is awesome. Um, that I can, or maybe six that I can like actively pull from and, um, you know, pull them up, chat with them, things like that. And so, um, but since I've been doing that, there have been other people who has been seeing what I'm doing um, and say, Ooh, I like what you're doing. I'm going to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And at first I was just like, like on, remember on Crypt, have you seen Crickly? <laughs> so you remember when he was like daddy that's my piece and he said monthly ain't my cake monthly ain't like that's how i felt like daddy that's my piece that's what i do and what i realized is that even when they try to do what i do they can't keep up with it because it's not in them to do it they're right. just trying to do what makes them work because they see my numbers going up right and mm-hmm. even though they've been doing it for maybe two three years um sometimes five and seven years and they're seeing their numbers are not as high as they want them. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, you're not seeing the whole picture. So let's collaborate a little bit. Mm-hmm. And in the collaboration, um, I have found people have egos. That's where yeah. you learn the drama. But that's also where I typically like learn to grow as opposed to being competitive with another podcaster. One, we're not servicing the same community a lot of the time. So mm-hmm. there's no reason for us to Which compete. Which is fine. Which is it's, absolutely fine because I'm not stealing your listeners. Right. You're not stealing my listeners. Like, and even if you are in the same community, you don't have to. One, you have to realize that people aren't looking for two take up spaces. Like it's not realistic. You right, can right. have your own um, niche and make sure that you can or talk to the people that are in the community and figure out what do they want. Exactly. Figure that out. If if your main goal is to grow your subscribers and stuff, but right. if you're in it for um, like altruistic reasons where it's just for the sake of like, you want to just share information with people nine times out of 10, then that's going to come across in your um, end product. And people are going to pick up on that and people are going to subscribe to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the one thing, even though a lot of people we have found that brainwashing is very effective this year. That's one thing this year that I could take away and be like, brainwashing is still very effective. Um, I who think that, <laughs> who, who would have thunk? Um, I think that when people, people who last are either work really hard to make what's fake look real mm-hmm. or their sincerity plays across where people can understand like, oh, this is not just, um, like I forgot the show. There's a show that just, it forces you to be emotionally invested in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy from Heroes is on it. TV show, uh, a lot of guys in Heroes, which one? Oh, the, This Is Us. This Is Us, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say Rocky's son, but I couldn't remember it. Um, but yeah, so I completely forgot the guy's name. But yeah, My that is name. like that show I've watched. I, I think I watched one of the episodes and I was just like every other scene, like you hear the music, like it's queuing you up to get the box of tissues. Just pure and, pathos, just oh, nothing but pathos. Just. Oh, I was just like the emotional porn. Don't play on my emotions. Like you're just. <laughs> So You're just funny. wanting to like, golly. And some people on the internet, some people are great at that. But I think that when you come across sincerely, um, it makes it that much easier yeah. to um, to not get caught up in 
looking at numbers or kind of you're more focused on the product. Yeah. As opposed to um, what somebody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And I want to create a great product. Right. I, I want to make sure my product is serving the community the way it needs to be served. And so, you know, when I hear different podcasters uh, like Paige, like um, like Kate, like Drake, you know, Jay, Mike, um, all these other podcasters who give positive feedback and yeah, you know, I checked you out. I heard this, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, even Baylor, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, like you're really dope. And I'm just like, man, thank it's you. Working. <laughs> like, it's working. That's what I want to do. Like, what do you mean man. being me is working? What? Oh, that is a whole, oh my goodness. Yeah, especially because we tend oh, to man. convince ourselves that being ourselves is not enough. You better say people it again. General, you better say it again. People in general have this idea that um, they are just never going to be enough. And so to have it validated in some way, it makes a difference. Because um, think I'm thinking about like even with me teaching and stuff and like I'll have random like students that'll tell me, like ask if they can take my class if I'm tutoring them in the writing center. They'll ask, are you teaching next semester? And so that'll give me some validation. Um, some of my peers will reach out to me if I'm working with their students to just remind me that what I'm doing is working and that yeah. their students actually passed a paper and they've been struggling through the entire um, semester. And so just those small things, it makes the um, struggle part a lot more worth it. It, it makes it that much more worth it um, or worthwhile, I should say. It does. It I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. I feel like I need a constant reminder uh, and not just an ego boost, but mm -hmm. like a like a hey, I see you kind of yeah. thing you know, where it's like you know, not not just that I'm working hard, but actually like mm -hmm. I can look back because my because uh, Kayla and I just did um, episode 20, you know, looking back on um where we started and how we got here. And I was just pretty much saying that this really came from you just saying, you need to talk to people about like your transition and how, how things are going and how you're learning, you know, to find your voice and things like that. And I was just like, man, I don't, nobody wants to hear me. Wait, who told you, that? you. Me? Yes. Really? This is authentic. I don't remember saying that. No, this, that was, listen. Real. Um, so for those who don't know, Jason and I have been friends for like, a let, wait, 2000, 2009, 2000, 2008, no, fall of 2000, no, fall of 2008. Yeah. We met in Spanish class. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I knew right off the top of my head. I didn't even, think, I didn't have to think back. <laughs> I don't know why I want to keep saying 09. 09 is when we graduated. Yeah. This is our 12 year. We, oh, we, wow. What is the 12 year anniversary? I have no idea. I'm gonna look it up. Go ahead. You can finish. Okay. But so when so when I was starting talking about the business and what the business was, um, championsofdiscourse.com, make sure you check it out. Um, when I was starting talking about the business and how I wanted to teach public speaking and do debate, I also talked about the loss of authenticity the more I looked for credibility. Um, or wanting to appear more credible for right. whatever reason. And you said that you should start telling this story. People should hear like what, how, what your journey looks like to get back to what your voice sounds like, which kind of snowballed very yeah. slowly, <laughs> one right after the other into Take a Space podcast. So it was just that conversation that started this. And so, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> Two things. So this the anniversary present is silk. So 12 years is silk. Um, mm. But it's interesting that you mentioned that because I'm going through something that's somewhat similar. Three things, actually. So I'll go to the second point, and then I'll go to the third. For the second point, um, I'm going through something kind of similar and I need to send you the article that I wrote or the piece that I wrote, but it's about 
just that back when I was like had first started at um, Sac State and stuff, when I first transferred, mm -hmm. I was like a wordsmith basically. Like I was really comfortable with using words. I was comfortable talking in crowds and stuff with new people. I was comfortable writing and just writing stuff and just throwing it out there. But over the past few years, I've lost touch of that. And so I'm sort of on one hand, um, grieving the writer that has been muzzled within, within me, but also being open to um, understanding that there are other ways that I can express myself. And so I've been sort of trying to document that same uh, sort of transition where I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I write again? And how do I want to enhance my writing in a different way? So mm. that's very interesting that you mentioned that. <laughs> um, I've, I don't even remember saying it. What year was that? Like how long this ago was, was that? This was this year. Yeah, it was this. Year, it was this. I'm, it was this year, probably January, uh, January twenty twenty, which feels like seven hundred twenty six years yeah. ago. Because um, I remember it was even, no, 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 no. It was Feb. When did we launch? No, no, it wasn't even that long ago. Yeah, we didn't start recording until like July, July June, or July. So I think I think I had the initial conversation about the business in January. I registered in March. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even going to do a podcast. And I think in June, we had that cemented conversation about like, no, you really should make this happen. Um, we probably had the conversation first March, May area. I remember. <laughs> I remember now because I remember one of your things was you were focused on the business side of things. And so I was telling you, um, find some way to document the transition that you're making. And I remember yeah. you finding that struggle. I remember you, um, one of the things that came up with professionalism. And I think you were at a point where you were saying like, okay, I think you were frustrated with the idea that you had to act a certain way in order to break into that space. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that um, stood out to me where it was like, okay, since you're making your space right now, you should document that. And like, you're, you're trying to push through and make this, space for yourself and yeah. being you in this space that is typically um, traditionally seen as professional, professional. No yeah. And I think that it's, it was breaking away from that Eurocentric corporate look and feel right. to what appears, feels and is professional to me. Right. So that That's is a journey for you too. <sighs> Because I can even, I even think back to when you worked for that parking place on campus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man! Not gonna say what it's called. Oh <laughs> man! Which one you're talking about? Even thinking back to like positions like that, you um, you carry, you kind of had this, carry this burden with yourself to make your present yourself in a certain way, um. So they would seem like, okay, I am, I deserve this space. I de deserve to be here. So this is how I'm going to act. You know yeah. What I mean? I've yeah, never shared, shared that with you before. Sorry. No, you haven't. That's it's very interesting that you say that because now that I've been having the conversation more and been kind of like digging through my own stuff uh, um, a lot more, especially during this time of recording, I'm noticing a lot that um, I grew up speaking in standard English, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I would close my words, I would enunciate, I would speak very clearly, I didn't really speak lazily. Um, and, but by the time I got to like fourth grade, I started hanging around some, some not so savory people in the fourth grade, uh, or third or fourth, and I think it was fourth grade. You joined uh, the gang, oh God. <laughs> Um, and I realized that even though I picked up some of their, cause that's how, that's what happens. Like I was always, I was considered the square just because of the way I talk. Um, or cause I wasn't like, I don't, I guess square, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but it was just because of the way I talk, the way I talk always betrays me in certain groups because I, I can, I can, I can, it's easier for me to fit into without knowing it. I didn't, I didn't know this. I thought I really had to put on. It's easier for me to fit into a 
Eurocentric professional setting um, where they think this is what professionals should look like because I can I can talk to them in their in their the way they speak and understand it as opposed to me fitting in at a dominoes game at a cookout because the way I talk is the way I grew up talking, which is closer to that standard English way of speaking. And right. so my code switch, I well, at least I thought, I thought my code switch was from slang to Eurocentric standard English, but it's actually the other way around. Yes. And e even with it switching the other way around, trying to understand what that balance looks like so that I'm not like I I don't feel offended now, but I used to be very afraid like to to raise my hand to answer the question and to be considered intelligent or considered smart the way I spoke. Like you didn't want to be um, exposed. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But now I. I think I do better in owning it. So it's it's interesting to say, cause I always felt like I had a burden to try to act the part, but I didn't have to act it. If I knew then, if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I yeah. don't think that I would have carried it so much as a burden because I can talk that way. I don't have to put on, that's just the way I talk. Yes, yeah, what you, how, it's your communication style, it's how you talk. Like it's your yeah. accent, it's your, dialect it's this that's the leah voice basically yeah it's not like a black voice is not a white voice it's a leah voice yes so. yeah and i think that it's um and when because when i would write I, there was an exercise that we did where we had to write things down and people had to figure out who said it and i was saying something about the the um exemplifying the beautification of something. And they were like, oh, that's Leah. We already know it. She's the only one who talks like that. And I was just like, yeah, that's right. What? <laughs> okay, I won't say anything else. But now I'm more like, look, yeah, y'all know who it is. Like, that's, that's, that's just how I talk. I like those kind of things because I like to try to disguise my... Um my writing voice. <laughs> See, I didn't think that, I thought that I stayed quiet enough that nobody would know. They knew. You stay quiet? Listen, okay. Is Listen. that what you said? You know what? You know, I don't need all that shade that just came out. I don't I don't need that in my life right now. Parasol, just launch it right at you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other thing, there was a third point. Yes, there that was. I wanted to come back to. Um, the other thing I want to come back to that you had mentioned was um, looking for now, I don't want to say validation, but I'll say validation for lack of a better word at this point. Mm -hmm. But um, validation from external sources, not so much for the ego, but just to reassure that you're doing something right. Um, one of the things that that reminds me of is, again, with me tutoring and with me teaching, teaching and everything, one mm -hmm. of the things that I've done this year is sort of made a conscious effort of, um, one, trying to re-examine why I teach and what I get out of it, what I want to get out of it. And for me, it always comes back to that um, in whatever job that I'm doing, I need to feel like I'm making some kind of difference. And so for me, it's fairly easy when I get that kind of feedback from students or my um, co-teachers where they're telling me that I'm doing something well, it's easy for me to just accept it as, okay, that means that the student is progressing and it's easy yeah. for me to, um, detach myself from it and to make sure that it is going towards my mission of doing what like making a difference basically um Absolutely. Yes. which is one of the reasons why it's been a challenge for me to start my own podcast which we've talked about a lot yes. it's been a challenge because it's like i want to do something where like you said i don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it and just for, to say oh i have a podcast I, um let's get the subscribers up and stuff i want to actually have conversations that mean something and actually advance something because if I'm just putting content out there for no reason, then there's I could just be standing on the corner just talking, even yeah. with as many subscribers as I, as I could possibly get, or anybody could actually throw my way, or as many as few subscribers. Um, it needs to feel like I'm making some kind of kind of moving things forward, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I and I do, uh, I echo the sentiment that it's not about self. Right. My kudos or validation um, comes from somebody saying, you know, you know, I heard, I heard what you said on the podcast and I never thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. that made me think about a time when I, and I'm just like, look at you connecting the dots. Like, yes, right. that's, that's what I want to see. Like, that's where I'm just like, it's not just like, Hey, I was listening to your podcast. Oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, that you know, is a good thing. like, did you, did you hear something that sparked, um, that sparked an interest or that made you want to change or grow or explore something different, you know? And my, um, my life coach slash my therapist, let's be real. Um, he would actually beat me up for like going with this, like, okay, what do the students get out of this? Because one of the things that I've have to have, um, been working on this year, one of the things that I'm supposed to have been working on this year is being selfish in some sense. And, kind of retaking the reins on that because I've sort of been um, almost trained in some ways. It's one of the ways I've been raised is to do as much for other people as possible and then make sure that you're okay in the end, like make sure you can get by in the end, but to make sure that other people are okay. Um, That's been both sort of a conscious effort on my mom's part, but also like a subconscious thing because she's the same way where she'll give as much as possible so that people feel okay. but when you're in like a creative type of profession or a creative space, that can be really challenging because it takes so much of yourself to um, be creative in that sense. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you are um, taking care of yourself, getting your own kudos for it in some sense, but also making sure that other people are taken care of. If that makes sense. So. Yeah, I, I think that finding your why and the purpose of what it, whatever it is you're doing, first of all, I hope, my hope is that everyone um, in life finds what they're passionate about and do it. Because I think that's the only thing that's going to, you know, help people to stop hating other people so much or being so mean spirited and negative and things like that. Find something you're passionate in, not revenge, (laughs) not, (laughs) not arson. Okay. (laughs) But, um, but find something that you're passionate about and work toward that. Because when you work toward that, you find your community of where you're able to serve and be of some good, you know, to more than just yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, when you find people that you're able to be passionate with, passionate about a project, it helps you to not focus on, um, self or even other people, but the gift that you have to give. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to feed yourself, you know, you have to sharpen your tools, you know, you have to take breaks as much as I love debate. I know that I cannot do it 24 seven. Like I, after a good eight hours of debate, I need a nap. (laughs) Like Give me three days off. I I, I can't, I can't do it back to that. After a good five, six years of teaching. (laughs) (laughs) But in all honesty, you yeah, know, I, I think that it's it's important to take care of yourself because, yeah. and I and I actually I had to have this conversation with um, um, a woman up here who's my Bible study teacher, and I just told her I was like, hey, you know, I I think I I need a break because I have been going consistently for about a year, and um, we had a break, but then I was just like, you know, um. I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of it and I'm going for obligation. And that is the wrong reason to do anything. I don't care. I mean, take care of your kids and your bills. Yeah, <laughs> you, those are obligations you should want to yeah, <laughs> adhere to. You want to make sure that you take care of yourself. But, um, you know, tra- traveling for the holidays, that's a large one. People, they, they have to travel out of obligation to go see whomever. Listen, COVID is still out there. That Rona is not taking the holiday. Right. Y'all make make good choices, please. Please make good choices this holiday season. But um, I think that if you don't take time to even have a mental break, whether it's a 30-minute, you know, trip to the park 
or a weekend at the spa mm -hmm. or a hike on the mountain, whatever it is, like you need time to yourself. You need time to, to get back centered, get back right, dig in to find new motivation and start going at it with that. You have to recharge. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, I think that's very necessary. You can step back and recharge. Yeah, because if you, if you don't, you run the risk of, there was a story about a guy mm -hmm. who um, was given this amazing ax and with one swing, he can take down a whole tree. So he did 10 trees one the first day. The second day he did seven. The third day he did three. And he came back to the to the person who hired him and was like, I don't know what's going on. You know, I've just been getting tired and having to spend more time on these trees. And he says, and the person who hired him was like, but did you sharpen your tools? And he was like, oh, yeah, you got to sharpen your tools as you use them. That's why you got to continue with your education, continue collaborating with people, continue um, honing your craft, continue taking your mental breaks, continue scheduling time to be with your friends, be with your family, be be by yourself, and then going back to your craft. I love being by myself. <laughs> I love. I like it to a certain extent. I am an extrovert, so yes, you are. I need to be out in the first of all you love when i come visit okay yeah let's just let's just say that <laughs> quite frankly i barely like being by myself if we're being <laughs> honest <laughs> that makes sense um but yeah just like those moments of we live in a culture where it um a lot of things tell us that we have to fill the space around us like yeah. with anything that we have to fill the space with furniture and with um, all these knickknacks and everything. And then one of the things that you don't really consider is that we are also conditioned to think that we have to fill our space with sound and with noise and stuff. But if you can be alone by yourself, even if just put on some sound canceling headphones with no music playing or anything, you can get a lot of different insights and just a lot more um, groundedness with just being, listening to your little brain or big brain, depending on who you are. Um, you can you can get a lot out of just being in that silence if you can get it. I know some of you guys got kids and stuff, and silence is one of those things that is a myth that existed before children days. <laughs> I know what it's like. That's why I don't have kids right now. When you have kids, silence is scary. <laughs> oh, what are they into? Like I That's like silence. Is scary. Like if you're giving the kids the Nyquil and stuff already, and they're knocked out for the no. <laughs> Oh man, no! You know what's crazy? This last week and a half, I wake up immediately, put on music. I finish the on music. I catch up on the news stories. After I catch up on the news stories, check out the new podcasts that are out. After I check out the new podcasts that are out, I do some work. In between doing work, I'll listen to a podcast that I need to edit. After I do the podcast I need to edit, I talk to my family. And it's just constantly like, I need to, I have this idea that since there's no people around me, I have nothing to look forward to seeing today. I feel like I have to fill up my space and time and ears with and eyes with something, some noise. Just keep yourself stimulated somehow, right? Yeah, I just... And I and for the for the longest I would just I would I would listen to my phone. I'm like, there's nothing to watch. You've watched all the things you should, you can watch right now, like. But then I'm actively telling myself, no, there has to be something else to watch. There has there's to be something. something there. Keep scrolling. Yes. Keep scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've done better with the scrolling. That's why I've taken a break from um, Instagram and Twitter so much. Um, I still, so now it's just like posting for the podcast and the business, but, um, but I've taken a break cause I, I would just be on every, every notification, you know, I got to post this. I got to, I got to mention this. I got to do this. I got to do this. But now it's like, I get to reclaim my time back, but I don't want to spend hours of my day, uh, you know, doing 
connecting with people who um connecting with people who who are not like legitimately concerned about me yeah and it's you know? just like okay what you're doing is just to go through motions right um when you go for like walks and stuff do you listen to music or do you listen to podcasts or anything um typically yes sometimes no because like i said i'm still like in a newish neighbor well i'm still new to this area so I try to keep my wits about me and make sure I'm just like, I know it's daylight outside, but the creeps kind of have no bedtime. Yeah, so, they operate all hours, so. Yeah. So yeah, when I do my walks and stuff, I sometimes I may have music playing like a uh, lo-fi beats yeah. in the background. But that's just because I need to, if I don't have rhythm when I'm doing a, doing a walking, um, you're walking, walking trail. <laughs> she said, when I'm doing a walking, <laughs> yeah, it's two birds. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm doing a walking trail, um, I, I try to have lo fi beats so that my um, I can keep a rhythm when I'm walking, otherwise, I will dot dilly daddy, dilly dally, dilly dally, dilly dally. Lolly gag. Gag. That's why, okay, lolly no, gag. Dilly Dally is one too, but I mean that one was giving me some difficulty. Yes, that uh, was because I, I couldn't I couldn't think about it. I was just like, oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? Lolly um, gag. Yeah, that. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm stuck on the words. Um, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> How how do you make sure that you keep that fine line where your ego meets your need of gratifi gratification? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you keep that fine line balanced? It's easy for me as the middle child to remind myself that I'm not the center of the world. <laughs> No, but seriously, like, um, joking about the middle child part, but it's easy for me to step back from things and remove myself from it and just be like, okay, this is not about me in this moment mm -hmm. um, so much. Um, a lot of that stuff I'll say for, like, when I'm writing or when I'm journaling or something, and I'll get that kind of stuff out and just talk about how it impacted me personally. But for the most part, when I get that kind of feedback, if it has to do with work or even if it has to do with like if I'm doing photography or something, mm -hmm. I'll take more so of, um, okay, this is what people like about either this image or this is what the student, this is why the um, students responded well to the assignment. And so I'm mm -hmm. looking at it in the sense of this is how I can build to the next level to make sure that it's even more successful next time so that people have a better experience with it. So mm -hmm. I'm always looking forward and thinking of how can I use this feedback to make sure that more students succeed next time for work part, for the work. So you're more based on the project itself as opposed to uh, the project itself and the results it yields as opposed to your own, um, I'm losing my word. My own need um, for validation or- Yeah, approval. because it, because it feels it feels like this kind of uh, this ego that, hey, I did this, you know? Yeah. And I see that with instructors, like when I'm working in the writing center or um, even, no, none of the instructors that I actually mentor for, thank goodness. But um, just even instructors that I had like in um, grad school or when I was an undergrad, I had those professors and I've worked with those professors who everything was about their needs and what they wanted to do in the class and what they got out of it, as opposed to um, them taking into consideration, okay, if half my class bombs an essay, maybe it's not that the students are um, bad writers or something, maybe there's a serious lapse in something that I did. And so I need to be receptive towards that, or for that, receptive to that feedback. Right. Um, and so with teaching, it's, honestly, one of the 
most important things is to step back for me as a teacher at least it's one of the most important things is for me to step back and remove myself from the equation as far as success because if i start to measure their success in how i feel about it or what people are saying about it then more students are going to fail and more students are going to drop the class and stuff mm. and at this point my my purpose as a teacher is to make sure that one my students make it to the end and to make sure that they are um, confident writers and that they feel like they are ready for the next um, the next step. Because I can pass to everybody if I want. I don't even really have to explain my grades if I didn't want to. Um, everybody gets a C. Yeah, I can it. give everybody a C. I can give everybody, a, I can just say, okay, you get a C, you turned in the essay, so you get a B. Um, I could do that if I wanted to, but ethically, no, that's not a good, that's not a good yeah. deal. And that's not preparing the students for the next level. So that's one of the things that I'm always looking at is how is this prepping them for the next stage? Well, that's good. That's good. I appreciate you for, for talking with me today because we, I think as people have to do better in learning how to manage that space between ego and self gratification, um, where we can actually just right in between those two, you know, serve, the communities that we're, that we're attached to mm -hmm. and maybe even build new ones, you know, yeah. who knows, who knows, because we could find ourselves aligned with other people who are looking to utilize our skill sets because we have a particular set of skills. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me, Jason. Where can people find you? away from here because of that horrible taken reference. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, JJ underscore Newberry at JJ underscore Newberry. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll be live on Thursday um, at 9 p.m. Eastern time, 8 central and 6 Pacific. We'll be specifically on at six Pacific time. So make sure that your clocks are set for 6 p.m. Pacific for our live. <laughs> we'll be on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, make sure to check us out at Take Up Space Pod. That's Take Up Space P O D on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, I am most active on Twitter and uh, my co-host Kayla is most active on Instagram. So if you want to reach us there, that is where we will be. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all so, so much. I couldn't make this happen without your support. We'll see you on Thursday. You have a great one.